Okay, so this morning we're here with uh, Professor Tony Bates, and I'd just like to thank him for joining us here. I feel very privileged that Tony agreed to come and talk to us at UNSW. He's had an illustrious career in the, the ed tech world, and I'm sure all the people in the audience have followed Tony's career over the years. Um, so his latest book is Teaching in a Digital Age, and today we'll be talking about just a, a smallish aspect of that. Um, and as the title suggested for this webinar, it was more to do with about video uh, and the use of video in higher education. So thank you again, Tony. Um, I'd like to introduce you, Matthew. <laughs> okay. Um. So, well, good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be able to do this. It sure beats flying 14 hours um, from Vancouver. Um, and I, I'd like to talk a little bit about video because I think it's um, underused. And what's happened in the last 10, 15 years is that video has changed enormously. It used to be very expensive and very difficult to use. And now uh, you're probably aware that um, People are carrying body cameras around. They're shooting. They're using Go, uh, GoPro cameras on their ski helmets and so on. And it's much easier for the the average Joe now to, to make their own videos. Um, nevertheless, is there's quite a lot we know about what works in the use of video in education and what doesn't work. So what I want to try to do is to um, open up some of the opportunities that video presents for us in our teaching. So I'm going to switch over to a PowerPoint. Um, there we go. I wasn't supposed to do that. OK. OK, I hope you can all see that. Uh, yeah, that that's, That's great. Right. Okay, so I want to talk about the pedagogy, pedagogical uses of video in higher education. Um, it's a topic that's covered in basically three of the chapters in that book, um, Teaching in a Digital Age. What I plan to do is a chunk of presentation, about five, ten minutes, followed by a little bit of group discussion, and then end up the talk with more general discussion after 45 minutes or so. So what I'm going to cover is um, I'm going to introduce you to different types of media and their pedagogical differences. I'm going to talk about what's nowadays called the affordances of video. What that really means is what it's good for pedagogically. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about the strengths and some of the weaknesses of video, how you decide whether to use it or not, what kind of resources you need in order to support you, and then a little bit of discussion. And the first distinction I want to make, because the two terms are often used interchangeably, is that in my view it's important to make a distinction between technology and media. For me, technology are tools and things without messages. You've got a pile of computers there, until they're switched on and somebody does something with them, they're just uh, pieces of equipment. And there's a lot of technology in education, like printing presses, TV studios, uh, computers themselves, or even the networks. And uh, the networks as a physical entity until something starts to flow across them. Whereas media are actually quite complex systems for the intermediation or interpretations of meaning and reality. And for a medium to operate, there has to be four components. Somebody who creates a message, uh, the message itself, the technology that carries the message, and somebody at the other end who interprets it. Um, so th those are four components, and the technology is just one bit in the middle, a very important bit, but still just one bit in the middle. And if we use that definition of media, then there are a variety of different media that can be used in education. Um, the most, um, well, I won't say the most uh, recent, but because uh, I guess um, speech and uh, speech and uh, listening is the most is the oldest but uh, text is um, you'll see text reflected in books newspapers and journals and so on and in books you'll also see graphics 
uh, tables, pictures, and cartoons. Uh, there's audio in the form of radio program, music cassettes, and more recently podcasts. And then there's a wide variety of ways in which uh, uh, ed educational video can be used. It used to be TV or film. Now you can have you, you, uh, video on YouTube, recorded lectures. You can have documentaries, talking heads, demonstrations. As, and I'll talk a little bit more about the different kinds of video and what they're useful. But there's also computing, not computers, but actual computing as a medium of communication. Social media, such as uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And the internet actually is one of the unique things and why it's been so powerful and important is the internet is capable of encompassing all these different media within the same, within the same technology in a sense. And if we look at media that they tend to have different dimensions and two of the most important for education are the distinction between broadcast media and communicative media. Now, broadcast media is a one-to-many. You could say a lecture is a broadcast because it's one-to-many unless you've got questions and discussion coming back. Whereas the telephone is a communicative technology, um, the, the power is equally distributed between the different users at the other end. And as I said, it's a dimension. Some things are both. They both can be used as broadcast or communicative. The, the, the other really important dimension for education is whether it's synchronous. Do you have to be there at the same time in the same, same place? Or is it asynchronous, uh, either in time or in place or both? Um, and that's very important in terms of um, access to recorded material. Recorded material is asynchronous. Books are asynchronous. You can access them any time you want to. You don't have to be at a particular place and time once you've got the book. Um, online discussion forums are asynchronous. Uh, this is both, I guess. It's synchronous for the people sitting here, but if it's recorded later, it will be asynchronous when people download the video recording. Um, so this is a little bit academic in a sense, but it's important to understand that different media have different attributes or and part of the skill of a teacher is working out which of those attributes is most appropriate for whatever you want to do in teaching. Another dimension which has um, come about re more recently is the difference between poor or single media and rich media. Th this, isn't a, uh, this isn't a value judgment about which end it should be. No, no, none of these are value judgments. They're, they're more like descriptors of differences. And so rich media would be something like uh, a television broadcast or YouTube video um, because it's got sound, audio, text. It has a lot of different media against a single medium like, say, radio, which is only sound or audio um, or a wiki or a telephone, that they're one-dimensional media, um, whereas uh, things like uh, uh, YouTube and so on and uh, broadcast Khan Academy are, are much richer and again it's a dimension and it partly depends on how these media are used where they fit in the medium so it's not sort of absolutely fixed but they tend to be towards one end or the other end of different media of different uh, dimensions so I'm going to stop at this point because um, I, I want to ask if you find this a useful distinction because often the terminology in this area are about what are we talking about? Are we talking about television as video? Or are we talking about video as, um, uh, as a YouTube? Or are we talking about video as lecture capture and so on? Uh, each one of those would be somewhat different depending on those dimensions, uh, on each of those dimensions. Um, and again, I, I don't want to put any kind of uh, evaluative judgments on which end of the dimensions you should be. It will depend on the context and what you're trying to do. So, before I go any further, are there are there any questions or comments? And I'll come out of that so I can see. Um, do you have um, uh, Brian? Brian, are you going to handle the questions? Yeah. So, does anybody have a question for Tony about the rich or poor um, characteristics of different types of media? Nikki. I was just going to say that as technology evolves, we'll see more convergence between these 
extremes. So you know, you'll see technologies taking on more and more attributes of either end and uh, being more flexible in what they can deliver. I didn't quite get that, Brian. Can you repeat that? Um, Nikki was just saying that um, that as technology evolves, as the technology evolves, things will become closer together, like the or converge. converge. The the rich and the the poor, I guess, will converge. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, we're starting to see, for example, um, webinar technology technology creeping into our lecture recording uh, uh, system. So, you know, the, the ability not only to broadcast information but also to have uh, the participants uh, who are at a distance uh, taking part in the lecture in the, with the students in the lecture room and being able to interact. Yeah, I, I think the important thing for for me is if you look at um, video particularly, it's a, it, it is certainly a rich medium and if it, one of the advantages it can represent very complex things very easily but the difficulty often for students is that it can t contains a lot of information because it's got, got all kinds of things going on in it whereas if you deal just with text it's linear, it's sometimes easier for students to work through in a, in, a, in, a, in a single medium than in a very rich medium. In other words, there are, there are skills needed in interpreting um, rich media and similarly with communicative media, um, obviously the, the end user has to have as, as much uh, communication skills as, uh, as the other end users and if, if one of them is an instructor and all the others are students, then he puts a load on the students and they, they have responsibilities that they might not have, have so much with a broadcast where they sit relatively passively in a lecture for instance and again I'm not, I'm not saying that these are hard and fast but there are when you move between different media I think as instructors you've got to be aware of these differences and I'm not going to make too much of that because it's fairly abstract and academic at this stage but I think when we get into um, some of the other parts of this presentation you can see why they're important so I'm going to move on to the next to the next slide and want to talk about two very important pedagogical functions of media which are often not really appreciated. There are two elements to what media do. One is the presentation of content, the representation of reality if you like um, and what different media have different symbol systems so they reflect the same reality differently. So when you see something, um, if you, for instance, let me give you an example. Uh, if you look at the concept of heat, you can show heat in a different variety of ways. You can describe it abstractly as a random motion of molecules. You can feel heat by touching it. You can uh, see the effects of heat when you watch ice melt and so on. And each of those gives you a slightly different understanding of the concept of heat. So you get different understandings of the same concept through different media and what that when students try to reconcile their different understandings through different media they often get a deeper understanding of the concept the other thing that often you notice in media is that some are very good at demonstrating concrete or realistic or pract practical pragmatic things another media are better at dealing with abstraction and we usually deal with abstraction through language so any medium that uses language like text or audio um, isn't so good for representing concrete images but what you often want is to mix the two so you, you want students to understand how the abstractions are derived from concrete reality and this is where media become very important so what I'm arguing is that different media also have different structures uh, different ways they structure content. So if you look at television it tends to be holistic in, in, in representing uh, for instance in a documentary a variety of ideas all mixed up and jumbled whereas a textbook tends to be much more linear and much more structured in the way it presents content. And again neither one of these is better than the other it depends on what your purpose is as a teacher 
but you need to be aware that there are these differences between media. Now, that's the way that knowledge is represented. That's one aspect of media. But another is how media facilitate the developments of skills. And by skills, I mean cognitive, psychomotor, or affective skills. Uh, if we take cognitive skills, which is often the primary focus of higher education or university education, it can be a range of things from comprehension, analysis, evaluation, and application. And often the skill of a teacher is matching the appropriate media for the different level or type of skills. So, for instance, text might be good for comprehension, but you may video might be better in showing uh, how an abstract principle is actually applied in principle in, in practice. So again, you, you've got you need to think about not only the presentation of content, but what kind of skills you're trying to develop in students, and whether you've got the right media for doing that. So, it, it, just to compare text with video, it, text has some affordances, it seems to be better at this than many other media in terms of representation, that's abstraction, a linear structure, uh, presenting a sustained evidence-based argument, it's permanent, so it's um, it can be challenged, it can be um, uh, reproduced, um, and it can also have graphics, so it has an element of concreteness as well as abstraction. Um, for instance, this is a graphic from my book. I was trying to get over the concept of lifelong learning, and there's a lot of abstraction about what lifelong learning is, but I thought this picture captured it of the father and the son working together on the computer, um, both learning, um, and it, you know, it reflects more clearly what might be a very abstract term. On the skill side, uh, and text is generally better at comprehension, uh, encouraging critical thinking, partly because you can go back and look at things over and over again and interpret them and think about them. Um, you have uh, it's good for analysis uh, and obviously good for developing um, lit literacy skills. So there's a number of skills that uh, text tends to be better at than most other media. If we look at video, though, the di they're, they're quite considerable differences. Video is very good at demonstrating things, of showing things. It's very good for bringing primary sources in front of students so they can see them before they've been analyzed or stripped down or uh, disaggregated. Very good for synthesis, for bringing together different ideas together in the one place and in very good for case studies, for instance, in social science of showing uh, people in real situations and real events and stories. and. It's very good for illustrating abstract principles in concrete terms. Um, on the skill side, good for analysis, although I'll come to that point later, students often don't approach video in an analytical framework, even though, for instance, in a case study, you might ask students to uh, describe some of the principles that are dis discussed in the textbook and how they're playing out in the video. Students don't take to that naturally. They, they tend to be very literal and, and, and think of video as being presenting information rather than expecting them to develop skills. And I'll come back to that later on. Good for interpretation. Uh, one of the good things about video, it, it can present ambiguous situations very well where the student has to interpret what's going on. Um, for instance, in, in theatre and drama and so on. Um, very good for showing applications of abstract principles and ideas, and very good for alternative or multiple explanations of the same thing. So th again, th these are kind of very qualitative, subjective interpretations, but I, 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 I've done this to show that it's, it, if you present, if you, if you use the affordance of the video, if you use the unique potential of the video, you can do different things with text than you can with video and vice versa. And I want to give a couple of examples of this. Um, I, I, and I, when I sh I'm going to show a couple of video clips. And I want you to look at these two clips with these two questions in mind. You, you might actually want to 
write this down because when I click on the video, you lose the questions. The first is, what is the unique pedagogical affordances of each example? What does this do far better than you could do in a lecture, say, or in a textbook? And secondly, what's the strengths and weaknesses of each example um, from, a, from an educational perspective? The first one I'm going to show you is a video made at the University of British Columbia here called An Introduction to the Central Nervous System. And the background to this is quite interesting. Uh, those, in, those in medicine know that it's very difficult to get uh, undamaged human brains. Uh, uh, you have to get them when fairly soon after the person has died. Um, it's expensive, it's a very difficult process to go through, it's hard to keep them fresh and so on. And so what UBC wanted to do, they, they got a grant actually, or a, don a, a donation, um, and the person who, the family that donated the brain said they wanted it to be used to save the university having to get a lot more brains to do the teaching it wanted to do around the, the, the anatomy of the brain. So that's the background to this to this video. The adult human brain weighs approximately one and a half kilograms, making up less than two percent of a person's body weight. And yet, it defines our humanity and makes us the individuals that we are. The brain is responsible for the generation of language and thought, attention, consciousness, memory, and imagination. In order to fit into the skull and accommodate the massive number of neurons and connections needed, the brain is highly folded. This results in the creation of gyri or ridges and sulci or furrows. If we were to unfold the entire human brain, it would take up approximately one square meter. Perhaps the most impressive feature of the brain is the amount of connections formed between neurons. There are an estimated 86 billion neurons in the brain, each of which forms an average of 7,000 connections with other neurons, resulting in between 100 and 500 trillion synapses within the brain. In an attempt to conceive of the enormity of this system, the number of neurons in the human brain has been equated to the number of stars in the Milky Way. Now that we have begun to appreciate the complexity of the human brain, let's begin to examine its structure. The brain can be divided into functional and anatomical regions. We will now start with an anatomical overview to establish a common terminology and to describe the areas of the brain. The brain has multiple surfaces. Here we have the superior surface and this here is the inferior surface. There are also anterior and posterior aspects to the brain. Here's a section through the brain within the skull, and we can appreciate the axes within the CNS. Connections can travel either towards the anterior pole, here, or towards the inferior end of the spinal cord. Fibers can move either rostrally, towards the rostral pole, or caudally, towards the caudal pole. Now, let's look at these component parts of the brain. Okay, so before we go on to the second one, who would like to have an opinion on what are the unique pedagogical affordances of that particular use of video? And what's the strengths and weaknesses of it? I, I think one thing, Tony, like you mentioned, you know, that having a brain just that part of it, just a practical side of it, having um, being able to do it once um, and video it and, and show it, that comes about, you know, with lab experiments and things like that, saving on chemicals or saving on, you know, setting up of lab experiments. If you can film them, then that's another way, I think. But I don't know what other people... And no amount of description 
really would sort of, uh, sort of replaces what you see there, which is the actual parts mm -hmm. and someone pointing to it. it yeah, so sort of Lynn was saying, you know, the actual parts, no, no amount of description could actually, like, no, you know, I don't know whether anybody in the room has actually seen a, a skull being sliced in half like that before, you know, and we probably wouldn't have if it wasn't for that video, too. <laughs> yeah, and one, one of the things for me about that is that you can see it very, very clearly. You can imagine what it would be like if you had 10, 15, 20 students all crowding around trying to uh, see what she was demonstrating. It, it, you, it, it's possible that they could see it, but you can see it much clearer, and if you miss something, of course, you can go back and replay it again. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Any, any other comments? Any other affordances that you saw? What about the weakness about that? Weakness? What's the disadvantage? We've got a comment. I thought the weakness was that it started at a particular point of knowledge. So if you're thinking about different people watching this and coming from different backgrounds, some in the middle of a medical degree, other people just curious, is that it it started off, you know, at a very low level of knowledge. So there'd be time taken to get up to the point that would be interesting if, for example, you already had some of that expertise. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Okay, I want you to look at the second one now and see what the differences are and what, again, the two, the two questions, what are the, what does it do that will be difficult to do in, without video and what's the strengths and weaknesses of this use of video? Um, while, while you're getting that ready, Thomas, um, we've got a group chat, he said one of the strengths would be that it demonstrates scale well, the presenter is the human scale component. And another yep. thing would be authentic learning artifacts, specimens are real. Yep. Yeah, good. This okay, is this is also from UBC. Illustrating how homophilus influenzae cells take up DNA. And we start with the cell, a typical gram-negative cell with an inner and outer membrane. And this next green set of images is just to introduce the players in our little drama, which are candy. Now these players take their places in the cell um, starting with the chromosomal DNA shown here in red. Once the DNA is in place it's going to start synthesizing the proteins of the uptake machinery. And these proteins first a pore in the outer membrane then two pores, one for nucleosides and one for single-stranded DNA in the inner membrane. Then the machinery that will actually pull the DNA into the paraplasm is assembled. This is related to the machinery of type 4 pili. It uses ATP as its energy source and force is transduced through a piston assembled from type 4 pilins. You can see the extracellular DNA outside the cell. Now we'll zoom in on a corner of the membrane, you can see the extracellular DNA. It can't get in, the pore is closed, and it's too small. Now the piston is assembled, adding subunits from its base, and the piston pokes the um, pore open, allowing the extracellular DNA to bind to the tip of the pilus. Um, here we show it preferentially binding at the white dots representing the homophilus uptake sequence. The pilus is then retracted by forcibly disassembling subunits at its base, pulling the DNA in through the pore. The DNA is restrained while the pilus is reassembled because it takes more than one stroke of this piston to pull in a long DNA fragment. Once a free end of the DNA is in the paraplasm, the DNA can be translocated across the inner membrane into the cytoplasm. Only a single strand is translocated intact. The other is degraded in the pair. Okay, uh, same questions. What what does that do? Um, that will be very difficult to do without doing it as a video. Again, I'll probably start. I mean that that could be done. Um, you know, with animation software and, and made 
make those sort of objects, but obviously this person doesn't have those skills, so they thought of a way to use the actual physical objects of the lollies, which I thought was a great idea for yeah, somebody who skills. Stop graphics are really powerful. Yeah. Communicating high detail. Yeah. So stop motion is a great way to present high detail, um, Robert said. Yep. Good. I thought that was a really clear representation as well. That worked for me perfectly. Right. What's the weakness of that? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I thought the weakness was you couldn't ask questions, so it was the lack of interaction. If you didn't know one of the words used, you couldn't sort of stop the video and say, well, what is that? Right. Right, yes, and, and you need to know the technical terms before you watch the video, obviously. So, I mean, that might be a strength and a weakness in the sense it, it's probably very well integrated with other other media, other, other forms of teaching, um, but also it's very dependent on those other forms of teaching for you to understand it. Okay, so that's what I meant by pedagog pedagogical affordances. What other major difference did you notice between the two videos? What's the obvious one? Well, one's a lot slicker. One's a you know, high, high production value in the first one, which probably would have cost a lot of money, I'd say. Whereas yeah. the other one probably cost a few bags of lollies. Yeah. The first, the first one was scaffolded with a narrative, much more than a strong narrative. Um, the second one was detailed. Can you hear? Can you hear Robert when he said that tone? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just, yeah, not very clearly, but I heard what he said. It's a deeper analysis in the second one than, um, and, yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the key thing here is the, is the difference in cost. The, the, the left, the uh, left-hand one, on my screen anyway, um, that, that was using a, a, a very professional video, external contracted video production team, and I think like Sydney, we have a lot of uh, Hollywood movies, we have a very big, uh, f film and television and animation industry in, in Vancouver and these people are available um, and they had the money to make that program partly through the endowment they got from the family that donated the brain. The second one is not altogether that cheap. You need stop motion camera and somebody who knows how to use that but it, it's a lot cheaper to do and yet I, in my view it's just as effective in its own way. So. That's one of the big differences that's happened over the last 15 to 20 years is the price of, make, of making really good quality videos come right down. Um, and it is now possible to do these things with fairly cheap equipment now. Um, but if you'd gone on to see the first video, you would have seen the importance of good lighting uh, and clarity because looking at very microscopic details in the brain, uh, you really needed to have that presentation very, very clear so you could see what was what was being discussed and pointed at. Uh, the, the second one is was more of an animation. It was more of a dynamic process that you're watching. And again, I thought it was a very uh, ingenious uh, way of actually showing that dynamic process. So this is what, you know, I think good instructors are looking for when they're going to video. They're looking at ways in which video can actually enable them to do things that they couldn't do easily in the lab or couldn't do, couldn't scale up for a large number of people, for instance. You might be able to do a demonstration of the brain to five people, but it's very difficult to scale that up, whereas the video enables unlimited numbers. And incidentally, I'll make this point now, both of these are free and open educational resources, so you don't have to develop them. If you want to use them, they're free for you to use. So that's another advantage of them. Okay, uh, so Tony, let's go through some of the strengths and weaknesses of video in general. Tony? Strength, we, yeah. Uh, we've just got a few on. Um, I've got a Twitter hashtag going too, and there's a few um, people, they've just been making their suggestions via Twitter, so I thought I'd just acknowledge them and let yes, you know. Yes, please. Things. Um, so... The cell video um, shows a concept of something you really can't see with the naked eye, which is yeah. a good a good point. Yeah. Um, with making a video of that, um, the somebody said it the the cell video like um, the person in law 
you needed a lot of previous knowledge to sort of so that you didn't get tripped up with that one because there was a lot of technical terms and things like that. Yeah. Um, yes, can I just follow up on that? I, yeah. I think the good, the, the, it's a very good illustration though of synthesis, of bringing together a lot of different individual concepts and putting them together and show how they interrelate with one another. Yep. Sorry, yeah, was, were there some more? Uh, there was some from the last one. There was a there was a question. If we or do we want to? Will we save those for question time? And I'll just come back to them. Okay. Yeah. Can you save that for later? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let Let me suggest some of the strengths then of of video. Um, first of all, you get both concrete and abstract, uh, concreteness and abstraction in a video. Often the concreteness is through the, through vision, what you see. And the abstraction is often the voiceover uh, explaining what's going on. So again, in that um, candy video, it was you, it wouldn't have made any sense without the voiceover. The voiceover was, you know, you, using both terminology to explain what was happening, but also gave, gave you that the you know the the abstract ideas that were the that led to those mechanisms happening. The second is uh, you can stop that and replay it. Uh, you could actually stop it and ask students to do an exercise halfway through if you wanted to. So you 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 can make it interactive. As, as a good point somebody made, it, it isn't interactive if you just play it through, but you can stop it after a minute or so and ask for students to do so, or students can stop it and then do the activity and then replay. And incidentally, if you're doing that, sometimes it's best to put the feedback immediately into the video and then move on to the next point so that students get the feedback immediately after doing the activity. Um, it's an alternative presentation mode. I'm sure they, they've done lab work around this, um, but it wouldn't be the same as seeing the animation. They might do the animation first, then go into the lab to look at stuff through the microscope, which might be more, so it may be used with other media as well. It's open access video, it's free for anybody to use, and it relatively low cost production, except for the first one wasn't, but the second one was. From my point of view, one of the big weaknesses of video in acad academic world is that most of us aren't really aware of the affordances of the video. Of video. Um, if you look at 95% of the use of video in education, it's for recording lectures. And to me, that is not really exploiting the affordances of video. Um, we need thinking about, and it, of course, it helps if you have some professional knowledge of video production to be in a better position. This is one of the great things I found working at the Oak University in Britain with the BBC, because the producers were really great at coming up with ideas for the faculty about how video could be used. But you needed that professional expertise to. Uh, set set off the academics. Once once they started thinking in that way, they themselves started to be able to come up with other suggestions for how video could be used. Um, another weakness is that although these are free, there are lots of other, there's a limited amount still out there at the moment. Um, and finding exactly the video you want to go with your teaching, or where to insert it in the teaching, where how to make it available to students, that, that's not straightforward at the moment. Uh, in the original production, it's time consuming. I don't know how long the lecturers spent uh, doing that, but it was considerable. Um, it's not something that you can just do off the side of your desk. And one big weakness of video is that students are often very passive in watching educational videos. They're not really uh, prepared to criticize, to analyze. They just take it as it is. And sometimes students will say, um, for instance, if you're showing a documentary, the students will say, I was waiting for, for the punchline. You know, what, what is it supposed to illustrate? Um, so again, you have to frame, uh, you have to frame the video uh, very clearly for students as to what they're expected to do with that video. Um, what are they looking for in the video? What are they supposed to do? Where does it fit in to what they have to learn? And particularly, again, this will come up a little later in my presentation, what are the implications here for assessment and what could students do 
um, themselves that would show what they've learned from a, that kind of video? Could they do their own videos, for instance, to show what they've learned? So again, we need to look at the student uh, as well as the, the professor in being aware of how to handle video, because it's not uh, obvious to most students, uh, despite the fact they're very used to watching YouTube videos, but you know, they watch them for entertainment. They're not really, you know, analytically taking them apart and saying, is this true or not true? You know, it's either funny or it's not. You know, they don't care a lot whether it's true or not. Whereas in education, we do care. You know, how, how, did, how did this get created? And so you need to talk to students, I think, quite a bit about what's expected of them when they watch video. And I, I, I say this because it's often a weakness of flipped classrooms that you know you put the stuff you put your lecture on the video and expect the students to watch it and come back and often you're disappointed because they really haven't analyzed it or even watched it thoroughly when they come into the classroom so again you have to frame it you have to uh, prepare them and tell them what they are expected to do when they watch the video and what will happen when they come into the classroom as a result I, I and, guess yeah I guess that Tony, putting it into like a context in the whole design of the course and sort of thing, and having you know activities around the video, or yeah. even you know the technology now you can have in video quizzes, which I know is not exactly the same as asking questions, but at least you could have it where it pauses and asks questions of the students as they go along, trying to keep them in, involved in the video. But yeah. Okay, I, I want, I'm, I'll come back to that point in a minute, Brian, actually. Um, uh, now, often when you go to the literature, you'll find a lot of people saying, well, there's no significant pedagogical difference between media. You, you can teach the same thing through a lecture as you can through um, video and vice versa, and when we do the comparisons, there's no difference. But that's partly the way that the research has been set up. Um, it, it takes the, the, the classroom lecture as the base and then looks at whether the video teaches more or uh, more or less the same learning outcomes objectives as was in the lecture. But of course what you're doing then in order to make that comparison you're stripping away many of the pedagogical affordances of the medium in order to make it um, to keep all the other variables the same as the lecture variables. So it, it depends very much on how you design video. If you just move your lectures onto lecture capture, it's not going to be very different what students learn. They, they might learn a bit more in lecture capture because they can play the video over and over again several times and so on, but it, it, you're not designing the video to really exploit the affordances just by recording a lecture. So it very much depends on how the media is designed and you may have different outcomes that you want from students watching a video than they than you would have for them listening to a lecture, for instance. You might have different skills that you're trying to develop. So you have to be very careful to make sure that um, when you when these comparisons are made, that you, you're actually looking, at, you're not stripping out all the affordances of the medium. And so you have to look at the potential or the uniqueness of the medium within the educational field in which you're working and what it can do that it will be difficult to do through say a lecture or, or a lab class. Um, and the other thing to bear in mind now is that learners themselves now can create rich media, video or animations and so on, uh, very easily um, without being highly technical. The ability to record stuff and to do multimedia presentations is a very good way for the students to demonstrate what they've learned. Let me give you an example from from the um, business field. Um, uh, one, one of the courses at, U, at UBC requires students to develop a business plan and be able to pitch that business plan to uh, venture capitalists to come up with the money. And to show what they've learned on that course, not just about the business plan, but also that they, they do a number of communication skills development exercises in that pro in that course the the students at the end of the at the end of the course one of the forms of assessment is a two minute YouTube video that they have to make an elevator pitch you've got two minutes to make the pitch 
to a venture capitalist in an elevator, uh, you know, what would you do? Um, just show the two-minute video and how you would pitch that. And the instructors have found that that often is a very good way to measure exactly what students have understood in the course, for instance. Much better form of assessment than asking them to sit down and write, um, write a pencil and paper essay or a, a test. So again, we need to look at video in terms of what students can do with video these days and how that can be used in helping their learning or their assessment. There is a, a t tweet from um, Dr. Jenny Richmond at just about that. Um, so I think you've covered it. Can you talk about students creating video as assessment? creating video to teach each other. Yeah. Well, I think there's two things there. One, to teach each other, or certainly to share experience. For instance, you might be asking students to go out and do field work and record what they do and bring it back and share it with other students. So it may not be assessed. It just may be a way of students to see how other students have applied what's been taught in the course and, and critique each other. Incidentally, I should have said on that YouTube video, it, before it goes up on YouTube, which it does, um, it's critiqued in the class and they get a chance to redo it um, as a result of the critique from the other students. So that's seen as part of the, the, the teaching of the course is the students critiquing each other to improve the video. And then when they and the instructor are happy with the video, then it goes up on, onto YouTube for anybody to see. Um, so why not record lectures? You know, you, I've made a couple of not so much derogatory comments, um, but suggested that this is not necessarily the best use of video. Well, I think one question is, uh, how are you going to use video in your class? Are you going to use it to enhance your lecture, which is one way of doing it, dropping in a video in, a, in halfway through or a third of the way through a lecture, uh, as I'm doing in, in, in this webinar, for, which is a recorded or it will be a recorded lecture, or do you want the video to actually replace the lecture? Now that's a more challenging um, way of using video to get rid of your lectures and have video replacing them. Um, or do you want to actually do something different than a lecture in a video? And I think these are very important questions before you even start making a video, is how do you want to use this video in your overall teaching? And in particular, what kind of problem are you using video to solve? Or what is it going to do that you can't do at the moment? And one of the main criticisms of using of videos, uh, of lectures, not whether they're recorded or not, is, is cognitive overload. The research has shown very clearly that two things happen. There's a focus on information transmission and comprehension uh, rather than other kinds of skills development. And often students, after 10, 15, 20 minutes, start losing attention and find it very difficult to um, take in everything. And one of the problems when you record a lecture is that students will often spend, for every hour of lecturing, um, two to three hours going through each lecture trying to make sure they haven't missed anything. Or the opposite, they skim it, um, which, which, is, which is even worse. If they spend two or three more hours on it, that's fine. But when you multiply that across a lot of lectures and a lot of classes, then students get overload and then they start running into problems and not getting through all their, all their studies. So if you are going to use it as, as in, in, in a kind of information transmission format, we've learned a lot from MOOCs and from the Khan Academy about what students can take. So normally it's better to break it up into 10 or 15 minute sections, then give them some activity to do, then come back to another part of the video and so on. And if you, what often happens is faculty will record their lecture and in a flipped classroom and then ask students to come in. And I would say, well, what, why not think about doing a video that isn't a lecture, that actually asks them to do things they can't get in the lecture, and then when they come into the class, not necessarily give a lecture, but go through the video, get them to discuss what they've learned, and so on, and use it in that way, rather than just having a lecture, which they then look at and come in and discuss. And again, it depends on what you're trying to achieve and what your learning outcomes are. 
I'm particularly concerned about developing the kinds of skills that students need in a digital aid. And these are skills like uh, critical thinking, independent learning, uh, entrepreneurialism, um, initiative, uh, knowledge management, and so on. And I would want to use video in those ways, which I would find difficult to develop those skills in students just through lecturing. Um, so basically, if I was doing using video, I would try to use doing videos what I can't do in lectures. And lastly, how do you decide when to use video? Well, I have to go refer to my book here because I can't really cover this very quickly. I, I just want to point out that what I've been talking about is just one component of the decision-making process. I've been talking about the media characteristics and the instructional strategies, which is only one out of eight steps in making a decision. The other things that are, who are my students, what kind of students have I got, what's their prior knowledge, um, are they used to using video in their learning, in which case you may have to introduce them more gradually and give more help to them. Uh, how easy is it used to, use the to use a medium or a particular technology? How much cost and time is it on your part? I mentioned the teaching characteristics. How much does it lend itself to interaction? What kind of activities can you build in with this medium? What are the organization issues? Do you have professional staff to help you? Do you have a budget for doing this? How much does this help you help students to network and communicate with one another? Not interaction so much with the medium that you're using, but with each other. Some, some technologies enable that much more easier than others. And how secure and um, how secure is this? And how does this affect the student's privacy? Uh, for instance, if you're using social media, you really have to look at that very carefully. And I call that the sections model, you know, because it's the it's an acronym for it. And um, so we've only been talking in this session about four uh, number four. <clears throat> the other thing about this model, it, it's it's not a it's not an algorithmic model. I, I've actually was approached by uh, a computer company and they wanted to computerize the model and I resisted that because basically it's an iterative process, it, it's, it's an intuitive process, it's looking at all these factors and then it's a complex decision, you've got a diff quite a lot of media to choose from and it's very hard to systematize that kind of decision making. Um, and lastly, you need to embed this decision-making process within the overall design approach. And I want to talk about a little bit about that before, um, before I finish. And that is embedding the design of the video in the overall design process. And I think there's a process that can really help you as an academic to make good quality videos that will fit very well with your course. And the first is to discuss your ideas with the instructional designer or, and a media producer. And following that discussion, and maybe at the suggestions, concrete suggestions from them, look at lots of different educational media, video, both in your own discipline and in maybe similar disciplines. So if you're teaching business, you might want to look at social science and education because you're often dealing with that kind of social context. If you're teaching physics, you might want to look at chemistry and biology videos as well as physics videos. But look at a lot of them, especially the open education resources, and see which ones seem to work for you, what kind of ideas you can get from those about how you could be using video in your own teaching. And then define more carefully then, once you've decided to use maybe video for certain things, what are the presentational requirements that you really want to focus on in that video? What can it present better than maybe what you're doing in lectures or labs? And um, what are the learning outcomes particularly that that video will serve? And again, I would look particularly at what kind of skills you, students could develop through the use of that video and how you would encourage the development of that skills. So it's not just a video you're looking at, but the kind of activities it would generate in students in order to develop those skills. Another question is, is this stuff out there already, or do you have to develop stuff from scratch? Is there stuff you could actually just slot in, and it's increasing amounts of video? Um, Ten years ago, I the, the way I do look for stuff is very simple. I go to Google, I type in the topic, plus OER, plus video, and then see what comes up. 
And so the topic I use as a standard is um, I'm usually looking for something that shows the um, normal, a normal. How do you explain a normal curve of distribution in statistics? Uh, and so you type in normal curve of distribution plus video plus um, o o open access or an educational resource. Now I did this ten years ago and I got about three or four hits and none of them were suitable. I did it last year, I got 250 and six of them were wonderful examples. So things are changing, we're getting more and more, but I could type in another topic and find nothing. So again, it's something you have to experiment and see what's out there. And then of course once you've got some ideas about what kind of video you want, how you're going to integrate it within the course and how you're going to build student activities around that video. Because if you don't build activities around the video and you don't assess what you're wanting them to do in those activities, what kind of skills you're trying to develop, they won't watch the video. That's pretty clear. That's one of the problems with flipped classrooms. Students aren't sure what they're going to be assessed on. And if they think they can get away and do the assessments just from attending the classroom session and not watching the videos, they're not going to watch the videos. They are being very uh, efficient, maybe not sensible, but efficient in their use of time. So that's the end of my presentation in a sense. I, I just want to throw out some questions to you. Um, is it worth the effort? Because it, it is an effort and it means thinking quite hard and differently about how you want to teach. Do you want it to add it to lectures or do you want to use video to replace lectures? Is there a role for student created videos in your teaching? And would you prefer to do it yourself or do you think it would be better done with a team approach? And the illustration here is quite nice. The University of Nottingham, they made a video for every element in the periodic table. There's a four or five minute video on each element. Now, how they did it in some of the more abstruse elements, I don't know. But uh, again, that's all free, open for you to drop in if you're a chemist. It's very interesting and fun videos that they've made. So can I put the questions back to you and other questions as well, if you have them? Anybody got any questions? We've got quite a few people. There's people being uh, tweeting, so I'll, I'll ask some of those ones if that's all right, Tony. Right. Um, so one is, um, how does video enhance the multimodal learner? Sorry, how does it enhance an open learner? The multimodal learner. A oh, multimodal learner. Okay, yeah, good question. Um, well, I don't want to get into an argument about learning styles, but okay. students definitely have certain preferences. Um, I have a preference for watching things rather than listening, for instance. Now, it, it depends on, on, on what skills you're trying to develop. Sometimes, well, my issue with learning preferences is that sometimes students actually need to use that sense of modality in their jobs. If you're, a, if, you're, if you're a doctor, it's no good saying, well, I don't want to watch something. I'd rather hear you tell me about it. You know, you've got to be able to do both. But, but yes, multi-presenting multi things in different media really help students because um, some students will focus more on one ask what one medium than another but if you've got it presented in different ways that will help nearly all students yep um, so um, what what's the best way somebody has asked to teach students to critique or think about video so when you're saying critical thinking, you know, a, yeah. a skill that everybody has, how would you? I, I would model it. Um, in, in fact, we, we, we had some very interesting research at the Open University. The first presentation of the Foundation so Social Science course was all documentaries. And it was assumed that the students would know what to do with the documentaries. The documentaries were case studies illustrating the principles. And that they, they had accompanying booklets and everything that laid out what the point of the video was and what the students were to look for, but the students were, didn't do it. So when they remade the Social Science Foundation course, they started off with almost talking head lectures 
with little video clips dropped in and then the academic would discuss the video clip and ask questions, you know, which obviously being a broadcast television program, the students couldn't respond directly. But in other words, then gradually he, he opened he, he opened up a bit more he'd show in the next program he'd show a bigger video clip and would step back and say, Well what kind of questions should you be asking this? And gradually they ended up with full documentaries at the end. And the students learning outcomes improved immensely from the television programs from the second version to the first version. So it's a teachable skill. Uh, it, it's like online learning. If students have done no online learning, don't throw them into a fully online course all at once, especially if they're you know, straight out of high school. Um, gradually introduce them. Give, give them little activities and make sure they bring those activities back into the classroom so that they know they're expected to gradually build up an expectation that they have to do things, not just um, ignore the online component and so on. So they are teachable skills and they're worthwhile teaching because com coming back to one of my 21st century skills, you want students to learn how to learn independently and it's a very good way to teach them to learn independently. That's great. Um, one question we do have, and I, I, th this one's just a, I don't know, technical thing, but uh, what's the optimal length of media for maximum learning? <laughs> this is one that I was going to put to you as well because there was an article, short videos are better for learning, right? Yeah. Maybe not. Um, and it was looked at MOOC videos and the viewing and sort of it, it was sort of saying there wasn't very um, much deliberate experimentation on finding out whether that's true or not. What do you the, pro the problem with answering that question is there are too many variables there. It depends on student prior knowledge, um, how much they can absorb. If you're giving a lecture on uh, thermodynamics to uh, graduate students, you can cover a lot more ground than if you're doing the same topic with students who are in their first year of physics in in, uh, in university. So, so that's one variable. Um, uh, you know, you can learn to sit through 50 minute lectures by the time you get to the fourth year, but you may not be prepared to do it in the first year. So, so that, that, that's the variable. Um, it, de it depends on how, how dense you make the, you, you put the material is. It depends on how much activity, how much discussion you build into the, in, into the teaching or questioning. You don't even have to stop the video, but you may just ask a question and pause and let people think about it and then move on. So there's no real answer to that question. But general, a general rule of thumb is that 15 to 20 minutes is continuous presentation is about enough for anybody. Yeah, I, I think the, the having a variety during a presentation is probably the, um, the main thing. Like you said, if you could ask questions in between, like your presentation today, we watched a video, we spoke, we discussed. Just the variety, I guess. Okay. I'd be interested to know if people in your audience have been using video and whether they found it worth the effort. Anybody? Uh, yes, I, I was involved in a um, uh, putting video for a Bachelor of Archaeology program with staff who are used to boutique uh, um, studio teaching, face-to-face, um, -face, small class. They found it very confronting. Um, and once we did some media training for them, they felt much more confident about uh, transferring their IP to, to video, which was one of their main fears that uh, yeah. become superfluous. And uh, once they left the university, they had to live on as a video. Yeah. Yeah, IP is a problem. Um, it's a problem for making videos open, for instance, but um, depends what you want the IP for. I mean, it depends if you think you're going to make money print publishing or which there isn't a lot of money in academic publishing unless you do a standard first year course and so on. Um, but uh, you do need to think about the IP and how to handle that. 
and you can protect your IP through a Creative Commons license if you make the video publicly available. In other words, people can use it, but you still own the copyright, and they have to acknowledge the source. In other words, you get the credit for it. They can't just drop it in and say that this is what I did. Um, and you have some protection there. Um, but generally, I, I think, again, also, when you get into multimedia production, who actually owns that? Because the ideas may come just as much from the production team as they do from the academic, for instance. So the IP argument is a, is a bit difficult, I think, once you get into, into video. What you want to protect, of course, is if you're talking about original research that nobody else has done um, and how you want to publicize that, then that's another issue. Um, I don't want to make sure you've got your marker on it, but again, actually making a video about what you've done is a very good way to put your marker down on that, that this is what I've done, and people will know that, it, that, it, that, that it's your work, probably much more than if you put in an academic journal even. But again, it depends on what your, try, what, what your goal is in making the video. There is a, um, a research journal that does, uh, it's called Jove, and they do videos um, of people's research. Um, I think you have to pay the product, the company, to be in the journal, and they, and then they send a production crew around to to video you. Right. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, I think we've gone past eleven o'clock, Tony. So we might wrap it up, and we'll let you get to your barbecue. Okay. Just let me give you some resources. Um, I yeah. talked about my book, which is free and online, Teaching in a Digital Age. Um, just type Teaching in a Digital Age in Google. I don't think you'll get anything else or, and with my name anyway. Uh, I think you've already had presentations from Jack Coomey and Richard Meyer. Yeah. Uh, I think the question about how long a piece of video should be, I think Richard Meyer has come closer to answering that question than anybody. Yeah. Uh, th there's a very good... Uh, site from at UBC called Design Principles for Multimedia based on Richard Meyer's work which um, based on keep it simple I can't there's four of them and shows exactly how you relate that to how you make your video how you make your multimedia and as I said type in topic plus video plus OER or open access and see what else is out there and whether you could use that so there's, there's increasing amounts of resources out there now if you're really serious about using video in your teaching. Okay, so on behalf of everybody, Tony, I'd just like to thank you again for, for joining us here at UNSW. Um, it was a fantastic presentation and I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you. And I have to say this is not my favourite way of doing video, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, 